Thank you much. When I was asked by Stacy Seely, and she suggested that I do the, key, the introduction to the keynote speaker, I stepped back and I said, sure, I could do that, nonchalantly. My response was nonchalant, but I have to admit that I was kind of excited about the task. Now, don't get it twisted. I normally don't get excited about or seeing or being around celebrities, but I have to admit, this was a little different. Uh, this guy has done some things that have been so amazing that it has garnered my admiration as well as my respect. In preparation for this task, I did a Google search. <laughs> Even though I knew a lot about him, and guess what I found? There were 96 pages with 10 references per page, which meant there were 900, if you do the math, 960 references about Jeffrey Canada. And I stepped back and said, wow. Already I knew quite a bit about him, because like a lot of other people, I've followed his career since he left Bowdoin in 1974. I read his first book, Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun, which was not only a brilliant expose on violence in this country, but it was also a page turner. I, in fact, I used one, some of his excerpts in one of my classes, which not only stimulated an exciting conversation, but many of the kids afterwards went out and purchased the book on their own. After class, one kid walked up to me and he said, Dr. Butler, can you teach me how to read? And I went, sure. I stepped back, I looked at him, I said, sure, son. We can do something about that. And then he turned and he walked away. And I looked at that book and I said, Brother Canada, you just don't know how many lives you've touched in so many different ways. I read his second book, Reaching Up for Manhood, as well as the book written about him and his Harlem, Harlem Zone project entitled Whatever It Takes by Paul Tuff. I saw the film Waiting for Superman, which was supposed to be about education in America, but it turned into the Jeffrey Canada show. <laughs> I also saw Jeff on 60 Minutes, Oprah, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, and The Colbert Report, and even saw him hanging out with President Obama. Brother Canada has done a lot of things since he left Bowdoin. He's received a master's degree from Harvard University. He has become one of the leading advocates for children and innovators in the field of education. Time Magazine named him one of the most influential people, and Fortune Magazine named him one of the 50th greatest leaders. But the Jeff Canada I remember when I stepped on campus was this slender kid wearing a light leather jacket that didn't protect him from the cold. He had this red apple hat that he used to wear to the side, cocked to the side, a small, closely cropped afro, and that crooked finger that he would point at you when he was trying to make a point or when he was in deep thought. <laughs> he said he was from Wine Dance, New York, and I used to think, where in the hell is Wine Dance, New York? <laughs> I remember that smile and that distinctive laugh, which would light up a room. And I vividly, vividly remember when he would always say, wow, when he was talking to somebody and who was intently listening to him, and he made that person feel like whatever he had to say was the most important thing in the world. I remember sitting in those afro am meetings up on the second floor in the Ross Room Center, where people like Rick Adams, George Caldoun, and Rasuli Lewis, rest in peace, drummed into our heads over and over and over again, go back to your community and make a difference. Well, Jeff, took going back to the community and making a difference to a whole different level. He actually adopted an entire community, making it his own and instituted real change. Now it's time to bring this brother out. But before I do, I have, I have to honor a request. My editor, uh, Cynthia Belton from Davisonville, Georgia, asked me to give you this message. She said, and I quote, I think you are the most brilliant educator, social scientist, and activist in the world today." Unquote. Okay, Cynthia, I said it. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Brother Jeffrey Canada.
Wow. Wow. Mm. <sighs> wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so, I always know when someone's read my first book uh, because I talk about my finger in that book. <laughs> and when they're looking at me, if they're looking at my hands, I was like, oh, you really read the book, didn't you? <laughs> That's that finger he was talking about that I, I don't point with. Uh, um, Mo, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, brother. Uh, this, is, this is sort of overwhelming uh, for, I think, all of us. The, the first thing that's overwhelming is it's 50 years. Now, it's not 50 years for me. It's only 49. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a heck of a number. And I've just been thinking, boy, uh, I am back at the scene of the crime. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a few things uh, today. Uh, but I have, to, I have to say, Mo, um, I have a lot of honors. And, you know, President Barack Obama is replicating our work when he was president, and the, was the books and the other things. Uh, but, but let me tell you the thing that I was the most excited about the award was Fortune magazine. So Fortune magazine ranked me as the number 12th most influential person in the world, right? So I got a stack of those magazines, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I went home to my wife, Yvonne. Now, she's a Harlem girl. <laughs> I've been trying to impress this woman for 25 years. <laughs> I, I, was like, <laughs> I, I was like, honey, 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 wait, wait open up, open, go to page 22. So she goes and she looks. She says, oh, OK. <laughs> Couldn't break into the top 10, huh? <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> so, so I, I, have to, I have to tell you that um, if you have a, a message and you want to get the message out, uh, for, for me, the 60 Minutes was uh, one of the shows that I thought was the most important. But it happened sort of accidentally uh, because uh, we were uh, one of the last shows uh, that uh, Ed Bradley did uh, at 60, 60 Minutes. So he probably maybe next to the last show before he passed away. Uh, and I knew Ed. I knew Ed through Ken Chenault. George and I, uh, we go to a wine tasting that Ken hosts for us every year, raise money, and a lot of you know, celebrities are there, and Ed Bradley was there. Um, and I used to tell my mother, you told me drinking wine wouldn't amount to anything. <laughs> we raised a lot of money for the Harlem Children's Zone at those wine dinners, all right? So I'm there, and Ed and I are talking, and Ed said, you know, Jeff, we've never done anything on the Harlem Children's Zone. We should do something. I said, oh, yeah, we should do something. We should do something. Uh, and so he said, so a date, he came up with a date. Now, this was the problem. So uh, if you grew up when I did in the uh, 60s, uh, America was coming apart. Uh, we grew up in a time uh, when I was in the sixth grade, they assassinated President Kennedy. Before I graduated high school, they assassinated Bobby Kennedy, Dr. King. Uh, the cities were burning all over this country. The black community was literally coming down. Uh, when I grew up in the South Bronx, it was literally burning all of it. We were living among rubble. And if you believed in social justice, there was one place you could go every Sunday, 7 o'clock, 60 minutes. It was the same format every Sunday. First of all, they had to find a scoundrel so arrogant <laughs> that he could think he could come on national TV and lie, right? <laughs> and I would always say to myself, it's the same format. Why do they think they're going to get away with this thing? <laughs> Yet, there they would be on Sunday. And they would be doing the interview. Uh, and Harry Reasoner would be saying, and I understand your company is polluting the rivers. And the guy would say, like, my company has never polluted the river. And Harry would reach in his pocket and whip out a picture of the guy dumping sludge, right? <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and I said, why do these idiots go on 60 Minutes? <laughs> and then they called me. So the day comes up in my office, and we're talking. Ed and I were laughing and joking. And then Ed said, let's go. 
And when he says, let's go, everything gets quiet. All the cameramen get, Ed pulls his glasses down on his nose. I said, wait, Ed, 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 if you know something, let's get to it right now. Drag this thing out, right? So, so, I, I, I want to, this is, this is kind of a, a weird thing because I want to talk about Bowden, Rustworm, and God. Right? I know, and I don't know how people feel. I'm, you know, look, I believe everyone should have their own faiths and beliefs, and I support them all. And you worship, you know, Jesus, Muhammad, Abraham, whoever it is, that's good. But I'm just telling you, I know there's a God. Right? Because, uh, wait, 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 because I'll tell you how I know. Because there'd be no way in hell I'd have come up to Bowden if there wasn't a God. All right? <laughs> telling you the truth. No, no, y'all think I'm joking, but you're going to see, you're going to see that my life, my life has been determined by incidents that are impossible to explain, right? So yeah, all the celebrities, yeah, but I know how this whole thing happened. Uh, and the first thing was I was never supposed to be here in the first place uh, because uh, when I was 18, uh, I wasn't a great student, but I was a good athlete and did some other things, had some leadership positions, and I won a full scholarship uh, to any state university in New York by the Masons. And I chose Stony Brook University. Why? Because Stony Brook was the biggest party school on Long Island. <laughs> and at 18, I had my priorities in order. <laughs> I'm like, you're 18? You get your own room? Your mama not there? 18, you could drink back in the 1969, 1970. I was like, get the party on. Let's do this thing, right? And so I, I applied to Stony Brook, uh, and I was accepted. But the secretary of the principal kept bugging me about this school, which I never heard of, called Bowden. She was saying, you should, I was like, I don't go no Bowden. You should go to, I don't care about Bowden. But this was time I was playing basketball, and there was a party and things got a little out of hand. And the principal uh, wanted us to come to the office. And I was in my way to the principal's office. I thought, oh my God, they're going to probably kick me off the team. And she said, look, if you fill out this application to Bowden, I'll square this with the principal. I said, give me, give me, give me, <laughs> give me that application. It's true. This is true. So I fill out the application. I send it off. I don't even think about it again. I mean, I get a letter from Bo and I throw it in the drawer. I'm going to Stony Brook. I'm going to. So in the June, I realized I haven't heard from Stony Brook. And now I'm starting to panic. And, and it wasn't because I was so gung-ho about going to college. In 1970, when I graduated high school, if you were not in college and you were a poor black kid, you were going to war. You were going to go to Vietnam. And I, I don't care what other people say, I had no interest growing up in a place that I felt like we were getting absolutely the worst deal in this country to go fight and die someplace. I had no interest in that at all. So now I'm thinking, oh my God, I call Stony Brook and they say, I'm sorry, we, we never heard of you. I said, no, 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 I want a scholarship, a full scholarship. They said, no, we never heard of you. Then I said, oh God, I gotta get in school. So I thought, oh, the only other place I applied <laughs> This is true. This is true. And so I, I go, you know, yeah, when you're in high school, you have one of those junk drawers. You do all your old love letters and other stuff in there. Yeah. Look into it, and there's the envelope from Bowden. So I open up the envelope. I'm saying, congratulations. You've been accepted to the class of 1974. Please contact us by, I don't know what the date was, May 15th. I was like, uh-oh. I got to talk my way into this school. So I call up admissions. I said, hi, this is Jeff Canada. I said, hi. I said, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. I sent in all my, uh, you know, stuff, and I. <laughs> I, I, never, I never heard back from you. And the lady was very nice. She said, Mr. Canada, we're very careful about those kind of things. We never received any. I said, no, you did. She said, Mr. Canada. 
No, we did not. Now, I'm desperate. Y'all are going to think bad about me now, because I, <laughs> I hate to admit this, but I decided to play the black card. <laughs> so I said to her, so I said to her, I know you're just doing this to me because I'm black. <laughs> now, this is what I didn't know. There, Bowdoin, like a number of other places around this country, elite Ivy League schools, had had a group of activists many are in this audience right now, who were determined to have this institution open up its doors, and particularly the poor black kids. Uh, and they were closing down these institutions all over America, and at Bowdoin, they were demanding 10%. They wanted 10% of the class to be African Americans, and Bowdoin was scrambling. And so when I said, because I'm black, she said, hold on one minute. <laughs> I could hear her yelling to the D, I got one. <laughs> so, so, so I'm in, I'm in. And I'm thinking, this is great. I don't know anything about Bowdoin, but how bad could it be? I don't care, I'm going up there. So I show up, Maurice is right. I was, you know, straight New York City. I got my clothes on, I'm walking the campus, and I'm just like, where are all the girls? I don't, I don't see, I don't see any girls. So, I went to the admissions office and I just said, could you tell me where's the girls campus? The woman looked at me. I guess you were thinking, how did he get in here? Uh, I said, there are no girls. I said, what do you mean? She said, it's an all boys school. I said, so let me get this straight. You get a bunch of guys at 18, get them up in the woods, and there are no girls? I was the most depressed black boy in New England. So, and after, so I, I was really, I was really, and when I say I was depressed, I was really depressed. This was not. And let me tell you what, what the icing on the cake was. I'm in the admissions office and I pick up a book and it has the rankings. And I see Bowdoin is in the top five or six. I was like, I'm toast. There's no way I'm going to make it through this place. I knew, look, I knew I wasn't a stupid kid, but I hadn't been prepared to go into an elite institution like this. I wasn't ready for this thing. I was like, so not only I have to come up here, now I'm going to have to flunk out of here. <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do. And then I got a knock on the door. Some brothers from the afro -Am. They said, there's a meeting tonight at 6. Be there. <laughs> this was not like a request, <laughs> right? It wasn't like you could say, no, nah, I don't think I want to do that, right? Uh, and I, I'm sure they felt look, we, we sacrificed to get you guys up here. Uh, and y'all are going to come, God damn it, and <laughs> come to these meetings, right? So I go to the meeting, and I'm kind of skeptical, and I see something I've never seen before. Some of the smartest, most articulate black people I have ever... I couldn't understand half of what they were saying, <laughs> right? You had Bruce McGee, he was up there talking about how he was going to change the economic structure in America. I was like, what, what is the economic structure in America? <laughs> He's going to change it. I don't even know what it is right now, right? I mean, <laughs> Bob Johnson was there. He was talking about going into Rock. He was leaving to go into Roxbury to save black kids. I said, you could do that at college? Rich Fudge. They were sitting there telling us, listen, we're here to help you all get through this thing. Uh, because you're not going to make it on your own. And we fought to get you guys up here, right? We fought.
fought to get you up here, and not everybody wants you here. Now, that not everybody wants you here was much clearer in 1970 when I got here when people were writing scholarly papers on whether or not blacks had the same intellectual abilities as whites, and people were studying that in the Ivy League colleges. So we're sitting around. Uh, the largest class, our class in the 70s, coming in the 70s, was one of the largest class of African American men to come on the campus. Uh, and uh, they knew, the upperclassmen, uh, what we were in store for. Uh, we weren't ready for this. We didn't go to the prep schools. We didn't go to the elite high schools. We were smart brothers uh, who were hoping we could get a quality education. Uh, and uh, when I walked into that afro -AM and I saw them brothers, and I listened to them, I said, how did they get like that? They said, that's what this place does. I said, this place will take a guy like me turn him into a guy like that? He said, yeah, if you can make it four years, it will. My mother called me three days later. She said, Stony Brook called. <laughs> she did. She said, and they, they wonder, where are you? Uh, are you coming? I had a full, full ride, tuition, room, board, books, everything. I said, nope. She said, why? I said, because there's something going on up here. And I want to be part of it. And I don't know if I'll make it through this place, but if I could end up like those brothers right there, uh, I would give anything. Uh, because this wasn't just about the individual. Uh, it was about the collective. There was so much talent. I mean, look, look. I wanted to be as good as any of them in any area. Uh, we had great orators. Look, Stokey Carmichael, y'all may not know who that is. H. Rap Brown, y'all may not know who that is. Jesse Jackson, I think everybody, these are all great orators. We had Richard Adams. That brother, you get him in front of the mic, it was trouble, <laughs> right? And people were serious about helping our community. Everybody was in it to help. Ken was talking about business, how you could help the community. Bob was talking about law, how can you help the community. Uh, Michael Owens was talking about medicine, how could you help the community. And we helped one another. I think the first African-American woman to get a medical degree was Gwen Stretch. I watched Mike Owens tutor her through all that chemistry and biology that black people couldn't get through to help that sister. I know she's a medical doctor today to help that sister get through this place. We were looking out for one another because it was a higher cause than any individual thing we cared about for ourselves. So, I wanted to be part of that, right? I wanted to be part of that. And I knew there were people here uh, that could help me. Uh, and the only question was, could I get through? Now, Bowdoin was not an easy place to get through then. It's not an easy place to get through now. Uh, but I learned some things at Bowdoin that last to this day. So here's one of the first things I learned. I thought I was pretty smart. High school, I knew I didn't have a lot of technical stuff. I thought I could get that cleared up. But when it came to reading and stuff like that, I was like, no, no, I'm good there. So I came up as a freshman, and I wanted to take a religion class because um, there was this issue in our community. I felt it was falling apart, and I felt like part of the spiritual soul of our community was being destroyed, and I wanted to know more about religion. So I was going to take a philosophy of religion class, and the brother said, no, no, Jeff, don't take that class. He said, those kids are smart. I said, no, I'm smart. And he said, no, those kids are really smart. I was like, well, you don't know me. You're telling me I'm not smart. I took that class. So I'm going to Moulton Union, that's where the bookstore was, and I'm getting books. And in the reading list, it was 13 books. It was 13 books. I was like, you can't have no 13 books for one semester. So I went to and I saw another person in the religious section. I said, excuse me, how many of these books do we have to get? He said, you have to get them all. No, no, how many are we going to read? <laughs> oh, no, we're going to read them all. Like, you're not going to read no 13. I was like, see? They messing with the black kid now, right? <laughs> right? They don't want me to get in, so they saying all the... They're smart, 
and then they're smart. Some of these religion philosophers, we'd see them walking around campus, they didn't have shoes on, right? <laughs> <laughs> they look, they look like they took a shower the night before. Here, these guys, they were so brilliant. I mean, look, I sat in that class, half the time I didn't know what was going on. I, I, I'll just give you a quote uh, that uh, Paul Tillich, right? This is stuff that we used to read in philosophy of religion. Uh, Paul Tillich wrote, the courage to be is rooted in God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> I mean, I'm 18, I'm reading stuff like this, and everybody else is having deep conversations about it. And I'm like, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> One of the things you learn in an institution like this, they're smart, and then there's some off-the-chart kind of stuff. Uh, and I began to appreciate uh, the uh, real diversity of intellect, because people could be brilliant in some areas, but boy, they weren't brilliant in all areas, <laughs> right? And you realize, but, but the ability to deal with that, uh, as uh, George Faulkner, they know I always try to hire people smarter than me. I'm not afraid of that, because Bowden taught me something else. Well, I may not be as smart as I think I am. I wasn't as dumb as I thought I was either, <laughs> right? So I was a psych major. Uh, it was only other one other black psych major I knew uh, when I was here. It was Greg McQuader, who was majoring in psychology when I was here. Uh, and uh, I saw my professor, uh, Al Fuchs, who was here, who was still in charge. He was the chair of the psychology department, and I was here. And my junior year, I'm doing psych. I'm doing fine in psych. My junior year, we had a visiting professor from Princeton. It was a woman who was teaching the perception class, which was a requirement. So I'm sitting in a perception class, and she's teaching. None of us had had her before. And I just couldn't understand the concepts. So I raised my hand and said, excuse me, uh, Professor, could you go through that again? And she said, sure. She went through it. Ten minutes later, I was like, I raised my hand again. I said, excuse me, I didn't get that part. Could you? So she said, sure. The third time I raised my hand, you ever have one of those professors look at you like, you again? <laughs> right? And I'm looking, I'm the only black one in the class. And I know what everybody in the class is thinking, oh boy, how did that guy get in here, right? So, so you know what I do? I don't say anything. I don't say anything. I don't understand, but I'm now I'm humiliated, and I don't want anybody to know, right? I just can't follow, so I don't say anything. So we have the exam, the professor comes back in the class and she is livid. And she walks in that class and said, I cannot believe this. Not one person in this class passed this exam. And I said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> None of y'all understood it? <laughs> right? Right? And you let the black guy keep asking the questions? So this, this is really deep for, I'm being said this was really deep for me. I said, how could really, really smart people sit there and not understand something and say nothing about it, right? Now, I, from that point on, decided I'm not as dumb as I think. I will ask. I don't care how many times you got to explain it to me. I'm going to ask until I get this thing uh, because, uh, the, the, uh, and I have seen this happen with really, really powerful, intelligent folk who honestly pretend they know stuff that they don't. They will not ask the question. And you just say, well, how, how could you have done that? Well, uh, Bowden uh, taught me that. So Russ Worm, we called it the AM. I wouldn't be here if it were not for the brothers opening up these doors, saying, give some other people a chance. Give them a shot. Uh, and, they, and, and by the way, it wasn't like they said, oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. President, would you let a few more blacks in? Said, oh, yeah, we'll consider. No, no, no. No, no, no. This was real struggle. This was real confrontation. And there was real risk. But you know what? They did it. Not for them. They were here. They didn't have to fight. They were, they were in the place. 
They did it so others could come in. And it made this institution a better place. It made this institution a better place. So now we're going to get back to this God thing, right? OK, so now finish Bowden, done with Harvard. I'm working in Harlem in a place that's falling apart, right? It's just falling apart. And my kids are dying on the streets. And uh, I'm just like, I, I got this plan, but I need some help. I need some really, really smart people who are, who are unafraid to go into combat with me, right? Because it's going to be a struggle. And most folks, they, they talk a good talk, but when it really gets serious, they're not going to be with you. So I was just thinking, but I don't, I don't have it. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have anybody. And then Bob Johnson, uh, who's, who's a lawyer, went and got his law degree and do it. He also became a playwright, right? It's such a Bowden thing, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, just show off, why don't you, right? So he has a play, and his play is in Boston. Now, I'm living in Harlem, my wife and I. We're in Harlem. Uh, I'm going to go drive up to Boston to go see the play. So, but I had to stop by my office first before I drove up on Broadway. And I'm driving up Broadway, right past Columbia. I stop at a light, and who's walking across the street? George Caldoun. I said to my wife, honey, 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 that's George X. That was his name then. <laughs> Let him explain it, right? That's, that's a different thing. And, and I was like, no, 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 I know him. That, as I, I pulled the car over, I went, not George. What are you doing here? He's like, no, I just graduated from Columbia School of Education, and I'm off, and I want to help black boys. I said, George, <laughs> I got a job for you. He said, well, Jeff, I really want to teach. I know you could teach. Come with me. <laughs> I wasn't always 100% honest. I know Ken probably has a problem with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> so this is what I knew about George. Y'all have to understand, when we had Bowden, uh, there was one person who was up every morning. And that brother, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke. Uh, when all of us was kind of hung over at breakfast, who would be there, eyes bright and shiny? It'd be George Caldo. That guy, he, he had energy that just never, he was like the ever-ready bunny. That guy just never stopped. And I thought there was nobody who had more experience in our community. Uh, and work in our community than George Caldo. Uh, you know, George is the only one I knew who knew Malcolm personally. Uh, I'm talking, this is some deep stuff. So I stopped. I was like, what are the chances that in, uh, on a, just a regular day, I would be driving up the street, and across the street would come George Caldo, the person who I needed to be able to do this work? Some of you might say it was an accident. I, I, too many accidents. Something's going on. So George and I said, OK, we need another person. This thing's getting serious now. We're plotting and planning that we need Rasuli. Rasuli, so here's the thing about Rasuli. Rasuli left Bowden, left this beautiful place to go be a real revolutionary on the, in the streets with the people. He was there working in factories, recruiting folks, organizing stuff. And I would say to him, Rasuli, man, you, you left here to go? And yes, for the people. I said, George, that man is unafraid, and he is serious. And we went and we recruited Rasuli. So now we got Rasuli. Rasuli's bringing some of our kids up here, and he's staying in contact with folks. And he meets Eric Bell. Eric Bell, he's not from our class, but we don't hold that against him, right? <laughs> he came in. So now we got the team. We're forming a team. But what I don't have the resources to pull this thing off. I don't have the resources. So I was saying to George, look, George, uh, where are we going to get some of the resources? So he says, well, uh, Bowden was, was giving me the Common Good Award. I was going to go up to Bowden to receive the award. He said, well, maybe you can meet a trustee. I bet some of those old white men got money. <laughs> Could be, right? 
college was looking pretty good, could be. So uh, this is in my mind. I have a meeting at the Robin Hood Foundation. I always like to go to meetings early because I hate to be late, right? So I'm down, I'm early, I'm just walking through Manhattan, and I see this black guy coming out of this rug store that's really expensive. And he catches my eye because I would think, damn, that brother got to have some money. <laughs> Because he was walking out, see, I walked in the store, I'd be walking in, he was walking out like he owned the place. So I was, I was walking, he stopped, and he looked at me, and he was like, I know you're just not going to walk past me. And it was Alvin Hall. It was Alvin Hall. I was like, Alvin, what are you doing? He's like, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Alvin in 10 years. What are you doing? I told him what I was doing. I said, well, yeah, I'm having a hard time finding money. He said, well, you, you know anybody? I'm going to the bone. He said, well, do you know Stan Druckenmiller? I said, no. He said, Stan Druckenmiller has more money than God. <laughs> so, so I said, well, there's zero chance I'm going to meet a guy like Stan Druckenmiller. Right? Zero. So that was great. I don't know him. He wasn't a friend of mine. He graduated a year after me. And I thought, OK, that was interesting. So I go to Robin Hood. I'm there with the executive director. And he sits down, and he says, Hey, Jeff, didn't you go to Bowdoin? I said, yeah, I went to Bowdoin. He said, well, do you know Stan Druckenmiller? <laughs> this is true. I said, in the span of 45 minutes, two people mentioned the same person to me. And he says, oh, he just joined the board. And we're all coming up to Harlem to visit your site. Uh, and I just wanted to know if you guys, I said, no, I've never met the man. I go back to George, Rasuli. I say, something going on here. I said, because this is too weird for all of this to be happening all at once. And so the site visit comes. Stan is there. And he, he tells the story. He's like, so what are the chances of me walking into some raggedy school on 144th Street in Harlem, visiting what they call the best program? And they're literally four African-American men running the place from Bowdoin. <laughs> what are the chances of that? Like none. So he says to me, hey, you ever go up to Bowdoin? I say, well, you know, Stan, it's funny you would say that. Next week I'm going up because I'm getting the first Common Good Award. He says, oh, how are you getting there? Second lie. <laughs> I don't know. So he says, well, why don't you fly out with me on my jet? <laughs> I say, well, there's, a, there's a little problem because George and Rasuli and Eric, he says, Jeff, I have enough room for y'all. <laughs> so we, we, we come, we meet Stan, then two weeks. I'm having a conversation with him. Because I say, I say to George, and I look, I got to get this guy on our board. We got like nothing. This is like one of the most powerful people. And we, so I'm saying, Stan, look, I, I want to ask you something. And I know you're a busy guy. And like, I know you've got like a million commitments. And this is Stan, anyone knows him. And he was like, if you're asking me on the board, the answer is yes. Whoa, OK. Here's the guy who makes a decision. This Bowden thing, right? Is, is no joke. Uh, the uh, forces that came together for us to try to figure out how to save our community, which remember, right there in Russ Worm, we were up there talking about this stuff. Uh, Ron and writing papers on uh, how we were going to change the inner cities and uh, all of us thinking about how we were going to go and, and educate. And here comes this opportunity uh, to uh, impact this country. Uh, you know, so it's 25 years later, work with 13,000 kids, 940 of them in college, over 800 of our kids have graduated. We have ended that generational 
poverty thing uh, in our zone. Uh, and it all happened just... <laughs> it all happened uh, just a few yards from here uh, when some folks decided that uh, they were going to make this place more hospitable and more open to diverse people. Uh, so, Bowdoin experience has changed me. And uh, it wasn't, you know, when I, I was uh, watching uh, the president talking with Ken and he was talking about professors, I had these profound relationships with professors here. That was, they just, they were personal relationships. Uh, that, that uh, included not just classwork, but after school. Uh, and when I received the Common Good Award, I told a true story and about Paul Hazelton, who was our education. I think Maurice and I took, I took every class the guy offered. They didn't have an education major at Bowdoin at that time. So I took every class as a minor. Uh, and Paul, uh, he was just this really, really caring, smart, sophisticated guy. He said something to me which uh, I, I tried to argue with him because I was saying to him how I admired him. He was so smart, so well written. Uh, and he said, Jeff, you're going to do much more in education than I have done. And I thought, hey, that's nice of you to say, but that's not real, right? Uh, but uh, he said to me one day, he said, Jeff, I, I, want, I want you to come with me. I said, great, where are we going? He said, just come. He took me for a long drive. And we went uh, to this stream. It's right in the middle of a city. I don't know what city it was. I didn't know much about me. And he said, just watch the salmon. He said, you see the salmon? The salmon were running down the stream. You're watching the salmon. He said, now, right there? Said, That's a factory. It's a canning factory. Uh, the name of my talk that I gave for the Common Good Award was, to the left of the canning factory lies hope. He said, Jeff, look, see that split? The salmon that go to the left go upstream and spawn. The salmon that go to the right, they go into the canning factory. You know how you sit there with the professor sometime and you say, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what, what is he trying to say? I know there's something heavy here, but, but what's the point? And he wouldn't say anything else. And he just sat there. And you know, so you know, you like whatever the professor does, you do. So I sat there. <laughs> and we watched those salmon. And I started looking at him. And I tried to figure out if I could tell which one was going to go left. And it suddenly hit me. Pure luck. Some people make it, some people don't. Pure luck. But black people aren't salmon. We shouldn't, just by luck, end up having our lives destroyed. We shouldn't just, just because, just because nobody is willing to stand up and say, you're going the wrong way, you're doing the wrong thing, that's going to lead you to destruction. And there's a way, there is hope this way. If you go to the left, there is hope. Who is standing there directing the people to the hope in this country? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. That's what Russ Worm was for. We came here. Those upperclassmen knew. We weren't going to make it out of this place without some help. Someone was going to have to direct us to where hope led. This institution is as important today as it was when it was created 50 years ago. Anybody thinks that we don't need a signal to all those people who can't fit into places like this, 
because they don't have a support group. They don't have anybody to show them the way. They don't have anybody who's going to take care of them. They haven't been in America. Wherever you go, I was talking to a young sister from, my parents came from Mexico, and I was asking her, do you have your people here? She said, I don't have my people. I don't have my people. No one else is here but me. And I said, but that's what we were trying to do with Russ Warren. We wanted a place where you could find your people. And there's nothing wrong. People always worry, you know, we want folks to integrate. No, I'm good with that. Well, that's good. But I wanted a place where people saw me for who I was and knew what I was going through, and so they could help me. That's what I needed. And then everything else is good. So uh, this, is what I, this is what I want to close on for the Bowdoin folks. Because this, this, I honestly believe this. When you're here and you find your people, there's nothing that you can accomplish. This education is a serious thing. And some people didn't take it seriously. I took it very seriously. I thought the answer to what was happening in our communities was right here on this campus, and I had to find it. And I took every class that even had an inkling that it might get me there. I don't know how many people it takes to change the world if you went to Harvard. I don't know how many people it takes to change the world if you went to Middlebury, Swarthmore, Princeton. But I know me, George, Rasuli, Eric, Stan, Kinshanault, six people from Bowdoin could change the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we, have some, we have some microphones up, and I invite you to ask questions. I will warn you like I warn everybody. I am very opinionated. <laughs> I might not be correct, right? So just keep that in mind. You can ask anything you want. Uh, feel free, come up. Who's first? Here we go. I know we're going to have a, just really a courageous sister coming up. Hi, my name is Karen Hines, class of 93. It is great to hear this. And I remember when I was here at Bowdoin, having you and uh, Alvin and so many other men who were in that era came up and talked to us. It was absolutely inspiring. My question is this. As a woman at Bowdoin, yeah. and now that you've left Bowdoin, we want to give advice to those who are here. But I think for women at Bowdoin, we're still struggling, and those who've left to find our place yeah. and make those connections uh, that would help advance us. Yeah. What is your advice for, um, you know, especially for those who are from the inner city who come yeah. to Bowdoin? We don't understand always the networking piece. Yeah. And by the time you graduate, you've missed the opportunity, and then you try to reconnect, and then yeah. it's a, a still a hurdle. Yeah. So what advice would you give to those who are currently here and those who are still trying to make their way post Bowdoin to experience that Bowdoin thing you talk about? That's great. That's a great question. And uh, so, so here is uh, one of the challenges when uh, you're coming to an institution uh, that you struggle with fitting in and, and making it. And it takes so much just academically to make it uh, and all the social stuff. Uh, one of the problems, I think, becomes that uh, you don't uh, have the time uh, to make the kind of connections uh, that uh, you can uh, create for when you're not here. Everybody's so interested and worried about getting out of here, right? But you're not actually thinking some of the folks that are here right now, you need to know before you get out of here. 
Uh, and it's odd because uh, part of the networking that goes on uh, is, uh, you know, fitting into a group uh, that you feel comfortable about. Uh, I used to tell folks one of, the, one of the best things I learned at Bowdoin uh, was they, they used to have these uh, wine and cheese parties that I thought was really a party, <laughs> and it wasn't, right? As far as I was concerned, it was drinking some wine I didn't like uh, and standing around talking, right? Uh, but I had no idea how valuable that was uh, because that's how so much gets done. Uh, and because I was shy, I felt insecure, I, I didn't dress right, I didn't have the right, it was hard to just go in, right, and, and just strike up a conversation and, you know, smile and be friendly and all that kind of stuff, because that wasn't the way we did it in the South Bronx, right? We just weren't, like, open and friendly and other. So, so that's the part A. The part B is, if I was a student here, I would have a book of every single graduate of Bowdoin and what they're doing and where they are. Because I have yet to meet anybody from Bowdoin that you went to and say, hey, I'm from Bowdoin. Uh, can you spend a bit? And they said, no. No, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't want to deal with you. Uh, but the ability to actually go and do that, I mean, because, you know, uh, we're afraid of hearing no. Right? No, I don't want to do that. You're afraid someone's going to say, oh, you're black. I don't want to deal with black. I don't wanna... So it, it stops us. Uh, from actively going out and engaging. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story of, about uh, sort of this issue of no and sales and other things. A, a, a good friend of mine, Ken Langone, he's founder of Home Depot, was on our board. George and I know Kenny well. Uh, and he was telling a story of a friend of his who was selling, right? They were selling hardware before they did Home Depot. And they were selling hardware, and you had to go out literally with uh, a package of stuff, and you'd carry your case around and go into different hardware stores. Uh, and one of their best salesmen uh, went to this large hardware store, and he was trying to sell, and the guy said no. And he came back the next week, and he said, oh, I'm gonna, the guy said no. And then the third week, the guy said, look, I have to tell you something. I hate your boss. I hate him with a passion, and I will never buy anything that he produces. The guy said, OK, left. The next week, he came back. And the guy said, well, I told you I hate your boss. I'm never, why are you here? He said, my boss told me if you're going to be a good salesman, you're going to have to hear no 5,000 times. <laughs> and I know every time I come here, I'm going to hear a no. <laughs> and I thought about that. Our fear of hearing no stops us from going again and again. Someone says, no, you're like, I tried that. I, I'm not, it didn't work. Uh, don't give up. Make, I always tell folks now when I'm asking them, make them tell you no. Come back with that story. I went to 25 folks and went to Bow and asked for help. All of them told me no. Come back and see what happens. Oh, there's going to be some, some change going to happen if we start hearing those stories here. So I'm just encouraging you. It's hard. Go out actively seek those relationships. Yes, it's much easier when you've been uh, sort of born into uh, that circle. You're comfortable. You know one another. It's harder when you feel like an outsider. Uh, but you just got to think. Make them tell you no. Please. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Nicole. I'm from New Jersey. I wondered, what are the challenges in replicating the model in other communities that are mirrored, such as like a Newark or a Camden yeah. or even a Philadelphia? Yeah. The, the biggest obstacle, there are two really big obstacles. One is that you can't do this by yourself, right? You have to have a real team. And as George used to tell people when he would go out and they'd want to replicate our work, one of the first things George would say, uh, you want to work weekends? You want to work Friday night? You're like, oh, no, no, I, you can't do this. This takes a real commitment uh, where you're loving what you're doing and you're prepared to do what we say, whatever it takes, is what Paul Tuck called the book. So that's one issue. And you can't just be one or two people. You've got to have a crew of folk, uh, 10, 15 really serious people to pull this off. The other big uh, obstacle is resources. Uh, this is not something that's going to cost a million or two million dollars a year. Uh, you're going to have to be thinking, how can I put together 10 
million dollars, $15 million, $20 million a year to do this work. Uh, and a lot of places are resource constrained. And a lot of uh, the foundations and others don't, they won't make that kind of an investment, right, in community. But I, I will tell you, uh, part of what's going on is uh, people think about some folks in our country differently. Some people are worth investments and other people are not. And I was at Harvard, I was, I was at Harvard and at the Kennedy School and I was lecturing to a bunch, they had me lecturing in some classes and really smart uh, young man said, excuse me, Mr. Canada, uh, your program cost uh, $3,000 per year per child uh, and is that scalable and affordable? Uh, and I said, oh, can I just ask you something? How much is tuition here at Harvard? <laughs> so he kind of chuckled. I said, but I thought you all were the smartest people in the country. Why does it take $60,000 a year to educate the smartest people in the country, and you're asking me about $3,000 to educate the poorest people in the country? I don't get that, right? So this, this is really about who we value and what we value. And those same kids you don't want to spend $3,000 on, in New York State, you put one of those kids in state jail, it's $60,000 a year. Now, what is that about? See, this is where we were back in the 70s, this whole conspiracy thing. Don't get me going. I'm going to be good. <laughs> But something not right about that. And I, I'll tell you this, in New York City, you all got your phones, look it up. New York City jail, $160,000 a year. Look it up. Now, why is it we're willing to pay that for? And what is the outcomes you get? You know what kind of outcomes we have to produce for that $3,000? After all my kids have to graduate, they all have to go to college, they have to be healthy. Have to, what do you get for $160,000? You get nothing. Safer community? No. People take care of their families? No. People able to get a job? You make sure they can get a job. We're totally willing to pay that. No one's um, getting crazy over it, talking about you can't afford it. It's a values thing. Ken talk about our values. It's a values thing. Wait, 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 I'm gonna let you speak. Y'all keep this up. I'm gonna be back up at Rustworm in a second, ready to go. All right, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. My name is Hilton Janike, and I'm a graduate of the class of 2017. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they say that um, a lot is required of those who have been given a lot. And you, for sure, have been given a lot. And acting in a leadership capacity often means you get credited for the times when things go well, yeah. and then you get blamed when things don't go as expected. Yeah. And so even though we're here to celebrate all of your success, and it's so awesome to watch someone like you in the position that you are, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that you haven't dealt with a lot of difficulty and challenges with the work that you've done, yeah. and that it hasn't been discouraging at times. Yeah. And so I, my question to you is, where do you derive strength? And what motivates you and anchors you to get up every day and continue to do this really difficult work that you do? Mm, it's, a great, it's a great question. Uh, this, is, this is a really serious, uh, really serious question. Uh, the wear and tear on uh, your emotions, if you care about people, and you watch people, their lives being destroyed. Uh, you see what happens with, with the addictions, with the violence, with the domestic abuse that happens. Uh, if you care, you pay a toll. Uh, and a lot of folks, when they get into this work, they, they, they're there to give to others, but they're not thinking about what they need to get for themselves. Uh, and I tell folk, uh, if you don't have a strong belief in a higher power, uh, I think it's just very hard to do this for decades and decades. I mean, I really think you've got to believe that there's a cause worth fighting for. Uh, and uh, by the way, every time I think, you know, I had it rough, 
think about some of them brothers and sisters. You heard some of those stories from Ken. But I think about all those brothers and sisters who never, ever even got a shot. And they did what they had to do for us to get here. And we're here because of them. They got, they got no credit, no celebration, no pensions, no nothing. They just survived so we could be here. And I will tell you that it makes me uh, sort of recommit uh, to this issue about struggle. Uh, but you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of your physical health. George and I, we eat differently, we exercise, we're serious about this thing because we know what happens over time if you don't take care of yourself. You're not going to get to be in those 50s and 60s and 70s. Not in our community, you're not. Uh, so that's what it, this other issue is, uh, I think you have to take care of yourself spiritually uh, and psychically. You know, the, 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 you got to figure out how can you recharge yourself every single day because uh, I, this is, there's no theory here. This is just just speculation, <laughs> right? The amount of psychic energy it takes to go in every day and fight the good fight. Uh, there's a limit of what you get each day, and by the end of the day, you're drained. And if you can't replenish that, well, you know what? you start ending up with these diminishing returns. So I think you've got to really, I don't care whether it's, it's meditation, if it's yoga, if it's martial arts, whatever it is, you've got to do something that replenishes yourself because this fight is long. And here's the, here's the reason, especially for you young people, you don't reach your ability to transfer wealth and power and authority till you're over 55. You're working all the rest of that time. So if you can't be somebody's grandmother, if you can't be somebody's grandfather, if you can't help with that tuition, if you can't help buy that house because you're dead, which so many of us end up, you actually undermine our ability as a people to move forward. So this, is, this idea of taking care of yourself, this is serious stuff. Uh, and uh, I think that that's the key that longevity in this business. Uh, and we need you all to be doing this for a long time uh, because we have a lot more work to do uh, in this country. So I see we're at the end. Uh, thank you all very much.